Are you ready to be stirred and receive an impartation of faith to move forward into all that God has purposed for your life? Welcome to the Stirring of the Waters podcast. I am your host, Elaine Haynes. I will be sharing what the Lord has given me through the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the Logos and Rhema words of God. Welcome to Stirring of the Waters. I'm your host, Elaine Haynes. And today I'm going to be talking about a subject that is really important to God's heart. This is episode 27, and the title is, It's Time to Uproot the Evil Infiltrating Christianity. Now, I just want to start out saying, I'm, this is not, I do not have a poverty mindset. That is not what this is. It's about the love of money. So, in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, which means ruined loss, actually means damnable, utter destruction. Ten, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So what is this evil? Evil is worthless, depraved, bad, wicked. You know, when I hear this, the love of money is a root, the root of all evil, right? It's like, well, wait, how can this be? When I think about all these different kinds of evil that are in the world, it's like, how can money be at the root of all of it? So I really was studying it out. But first, let me just say what the root, what the word all means. It's actually the Greek word pass, which is a root word itself that includes all forms of declension. And Merriam-Webster defines declension as a falling away, a deterioration. So it's whatever causes a falling away. Now, in Hebrews 13 and 5, we're told to keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have, for he, Christ, has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we see from 1 Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain, and Hebrews 13 and 5, be content with what you have, that contentment is at the root, that the love of money is a contentment, or a discontentment, you could say, problem. So that's one thing, you know, studying this out, let me just share, there's, there's four key things here. The love of money is a contentment problem. The love of money is an identity problem. For we brought nothing, we, you, me, brought nothing into this world. And we cannot take anything out of it. Where did we come from? Whose are we? And if we're not our own, then our finances are not our own problem. It's an identity problem, the love of money not recognizing whose we are. The love of money is a sin problem. It says, from which some have strayed from the faith. They fall into temptation and a snare. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. It's a sin problem. And the love of money is a worship problem. Those who desire to be rich, what are we desiring? The root system of the love of money runs deep and wide through the soil of the human heart. That's found in Mark 4, 14 and 18 and 19, where Jesus talks about the sower and the seed. We know that this, the sower is God and the seed is the word of God. And in the heart soils that it describes, we have those which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, entering and chokes the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And I'm going to be getting into deceitfulness of riches in a little bit, but I want to go back to this this key um, scripture. The love of money is the root, is the root of all kinds of evil. And the godliness, you know, starting with 1 Timothy 6, it's, it's the whole thing is 6 through 10. So what are the roots bringing the fruit of the love of money? because every root will bring forth some kind of fruit. So if the fruit is the love of money, what is the root? Discontentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. A discontented person lacks humility. Why do I say that? Well, if you're discontented, you're not thankful. 
And if you're not thankful, it's because you think you deserve more than what you have. And that discontentment will eventually get you to question the goodness of God. Because if it all comes back to, if God's your provider and you're discontented, then you think you deserve more than he's giving you, right? Then you're going to question his goodness. It just, you know, you have to go back sometimes with our thoughts. We have to go back to what is the source and what, where did it come from? What is the real root of this thing? And I'm going to just tell you this, worldly culture and lifestyle, we can see this, is totally centered on self. It's centered on immediate desires and our feelings versus godly character and serving others, which is what Christianity is all about. Happiness is more important than holiness to a worldly person. God looks at it the other way. He's more concerned with your holiness than with your happiness. Now, I'm just going to flat out say that when you are serving God, when you are centered, when, you're, when your um, worldview is centered around God and wanting to please Him and wanting to fulfill His calling in your life, doing that will bring you such joy that happiness is a byproduct of that. So it's, it's a... It's a paradoxical system, the kingdom, in that it's an upside down, I've heard it said, you know, than what the, the way that the world is. You know, you don't go seeking after happiness. You go, out, go about serving God and serving others, and happiness will come. Because you were created for that. You were created for God. So, okay, so what does our life revolve around? Again, godliness with contentment is great gain. If my worldview revolves around me, not God, money won't ever be seen in the proper perspective. It'll all be about me. It won't be seen as wanting to, recognizing that, that whatever God gives me is a gift. And it's obviously, it's going to take care of my needs, but it's really to, you're really to be a funnel for it to flow through and build the kingdom and bless others. So if I recognize I was created by God and am to live for Him, I will look to Him to provide the means for me to do what He's called me to do. Without God at the center, money becomes the means to bring about the end. What is the end? What we need and want. Even if it's even if it's ministry, if you're ministry focused, but you're not looking at God as the as the provider, the supernatural provider, the one. If He put that that ministry on your heart, He's going to provide the provision for it. Versus us striving getting out of the place of resting in Christ and striving to make it happen, using worldly ways to make it happen. When we, when money becomes something to satisfy us, to bring about the things that we want and need, our desires, the way we're looking at it, discomfort then becomes the evil that we're seeking to eradicate, where it's flipped. Discomfort becomes the evil. Did you hear that? If you're looking to serve self, then being uncomfortable is going to be the means is going to be the thing you're trying to get rid of. You want to be comfortable, right? Looking at self and doubting God was the source of the original sin in the Garden of Eden and still is today. Because that's what happened with, with Satan. He started looking at himself. He wanted, he wanted the worship that was due God for himself. And he got Eve to look at self. Oh, oh it's God is holding holding out on you. If you eat of this fruit, then you'll be like him and you'll be able to know good and evil. Well, they were already like God. They already had everything. They didn't need anything else. The devil is a liar. And if, you, if you're self-focused, you're forgetting whose you are and you have everything that you need because you have God. So what forms our identity? That's that, that section in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. We brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. We're formed by God. We're in his image. We're created for the works he's ordained for our lives. We'll be with him forever after our physical body dies. If we forget this, money will rule us. Our identity will be in how much money we have, what we're going to do with it, what job we want to uphold our lifestyle and our heart's desire. So the love of money is also a sin problem. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And I'll give you an example because, again, this is where I really had to do some thinking on this. It's like, wait a minute, how can it be the root of all kinds of evil? When I think of, you know, I think of murder. You know, how many times has murder been because of money? Um, think of sex trafficking, drug dealing, investing into companies that are promoting evil, ungodly agendas. 
but they've got a good return. That's all surface value. Now I'm going to talk a little deeper. When we are deceived, when we are deceived by thinking that money is the answer or any kind of deception, then we cannot recognize truth anymore and that's when we fall into other kinds of sin because we're already in deception. If you're in deception in one area, you're not going to be, everything is going to be skewed. You're, you have a filter and it's not going to be right. And that's how it is when that's how it is that you can fall into other types of sin. We live in a fallen world because of sin and the enemy wants us to be trapped and bound and unable to live the kingdom life. The temptation is everywhere. And the enemy is continually trying to tempt us to worship and serve him. It may look like something else, but that's the bottom line. He does not want us to worship God or serve God. He wants us to worship him, the enemy, and which is in effect itself. He'll put your eyes on yourself. What do you what do you feel like you're lacking? You do the comparison thing. He's the God of this world, and he's going to continually try to tempt you. How? Through worshiping and serving self versus the one who created us and created the world that we're given to steward and advance the kingdom of God. So it brings up the final point. Who and what do you worship? Again, desire to be rich. What do you desire? Desiring to be rich is the world system. It operates on money. Psalm 27.4 gives us an answer. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 19, 9 through 11, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them as thy servant warned, in keeping of them is great reward. God has a way of rewarding us when we trust him, when we follow him, when we look to him, that's what he wants. He wants us to look to him and be dependent upon him, to recognize we are dependent upon him. And he will reward us. Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And what's beautiful about it is when you start delighting yourself in the Lord, your desires change because you find that he is the one who, for with that for whom your heart has been longing for. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the deceitfulness of riches. It's been said money is a deceitful master. Jesus said even the elect can be deceived in Matthew 24 and 24. In Ephesians 4:22 in the Amplified, it says, we fall into sin after being deceived. We're under delusion. Once we're in deception, many other delusions come in. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Get, put, excuse me, put off and discard your old unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion. You're not looking at delusion as you're not looking at things rightly. You're not looking at things through that alignment with the truth of who God is, who you are in him, and what his word says. In Mark 4, 19, again, that's the, the sower and the seed, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. And Jesus says in Matthew 16, 26, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He also tells us in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, I'm sure you're all familiar with this section of scripture, but it's powerful. I'm just, I'm just going to read it. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. You know, I'll just flat out say this too. I'm just going to interject here. Is that invariably what I have found, it was true when I had money, when I was working a career, and, and I'm going to share that a little bit, but um, it's never enough. So a person that has a lot of money, their thoughts are consumed with how to keep it. So anyway, back to the scripture. Where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. 
If then I be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. Here's the key part. Either he will love, hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, Jesus said that. I didn't. You can't serve God and money. What is mammon? It's money. In Strong's Concordance, this is powerful. It actually means confidence. And here's what it says alongside that. Wealth is personified, made personal, when we become confident from it. And when money is deified, it becomes our God. It becomes avarice, which means extreme greed for wealth or material gain. This is the power of the spirit of mammon. This is the power of, this is why it is so important to keep your heart, your life free from the love of money. I hear the Lord say that some are in a mammon test and may not be aware of it. But what does that look like? When you're trying to serve God, but your heart is serving mammon. How do you know your heart is serving mammon? Because you're thinking about how to make more money. You're thinking about your your financial situation. Your your mind and your and your life is consumed. And it may not, when I say consumed, it may not be like every thought every day, but it comes up a lot. And it's 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 striving to save it. It's striving to, striving to keep it. It's it's everything is is wrapped around um, how to provide basically for yourself. Put it that way. And if you're in ministry, in part, it's how to get more people in so you get the big tithe checks to, or the donations to get to, and you say it's to do what God's called you to do. But it's flipped there and it's a real subtle thing and we have to be really careful of that. Because if we just stay focused on God and do what he's called us to do, he's going to provide it sometimes supernaturally. The reality is the world is based on and ruled by the spirit of mammon. And this spirit, creates greed and lust that is never satisfied. And it's really hard to live in this world and not be affected and infected by it. You've got competition, you've got comparison, and the eye is never satisfied, Proverbs 27, 20 tells us. Now we can know from the Apostle John in 1 John 2, 16, he makes it very clear. All that is in the world, and here it is. What is all that is in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And what about it? It's not of the Father, it's of the world. The kingdom of God is ruled by the king, who is a God of giving. He gave his best for us in Jesus. He made us co-heirs with him, and he tells us he will provide for every need that we have when we seek his kingdom first. That's Matthew 6, 33 and 34. Where he, at the end of 34, he says, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, so therefore take no thought for tomorrow. In other words, you've got evil that's surrounding you every day, so seek first the kingdom of God and then he'll take care of your needs. And then Philippians 4.19, this is a powerful and beautiful verse. My God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's a supernatural way. It's a way that we don't understand. And again, it's because our mind has been trained to think like the world thinks. And that's not how the kingdom is. That's not how God's way is. It's through our relationship in Christ. It's through our serving him. It's through our following God that our needs are met. It's a heart issue. Do we trust God? Now here, I'm going to share a little testimony with you. I struggled with this for years, the desire for, for, for financial security. It was a basis for many of my decisions. Now, I'm going to back up a little. When I was first born again, I had absolutely nothing material. Now, that's a long story in itself. Maybe another time. Everything I had, and I knew this, everything was a gift from God. Everything. It was easy then to have complete trust in a faithful God because I had nowhere else to turn. I had nothing. I lived day to day in his grace. I was a single mom, and he provided, and oftentimes supernaturally. One time, this person came to my door with a box of food. Literally. I was a faithful giver. I recognized that everything I had came from him and belonged to him. Romans eleven thirty six for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Everything comes from him. He is the source of all things. He is the source of life and he is the source of your life. Then over the years, God kept blessing me with favor and increase with good jobs. And the more that I, I, I made, the more I began to desire. I was in the world. I was hearing the world's ways about living. I was hearing about, you know, you need to invest in this and all oh, you need to save up for that. And 
and um, I was seeing others accumulate things and my eyes wondered what I saw. I became more and more influenced by that. It was never enough and it became a focus in my thought life, even though I was serving God and faithfully tithing, giving offerings and sowing seeds of faith. It was still, I had that mindset wrapped around money and that whole financial security thing. So then it came to a point where I took a step of faith and retired. And I'd like to say that, oh, it was just God told me to do it and I did it. Just, no, it was a big struggle and I ended up, I almost died. That's a whole other testimony. If you're interested in that, you can you know, get my book, Too Many Voices, My Journey from Confusion to Clarity. I can, you can hear the, read the whole process um, of how that all came about, where I ended up with starting out with absolutely nothing, and then um, how God brought me to the place where he was telling me to retire, and I wasn't listening. I didn't believe it was him. And that's a whole other story. Anyway, I'm getting back to my point here. My point is when he told me to step up, to take that step of faith and retire, he really emphasized the need to be free of this mindset and to get back into that place of totally trusting him. Why? Because his kingdom is at hand and to walk in the fullness of blessing, whether it's spiritual or natural, to fulfill his calling and destiny. It requires complete trust and obedience in all areas, including finances. At the end of 2016, God showed me and my husband that a step of faith was imminent. Again, my step of faith in retirement was in 2000. This is 2006, two, excuse me, 2010. In 2016, the next step of faith for us was a huge transition for trust. You know, it was one thing for me to retire and still have my husband's income, but now God's telling him to retire, and we both into full-time ministry. So we took some time of consecrated seeking, and then it took my husband a few more months before he was ready to take the leap, and then it put us into a place that to the world was foolish. It was foolish to the world's ways of looking at things. It would reduce our income drastically. But we knew that God was calling us into trusting him as he led us into full-time ministry. And I can honestly tell you that. It brought such freedom. We didn't feel the pressure of trying to gain financial security anymore. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God would provide. He reminded me of my early faith years and he provided everything. What was the next step? I sowed seed. Why? To seal the deal in my heart. I've learned over the years that when you receive a word of promise, you sow a seed, and the result is God will provide. He, will, he opened doors and he brought increase in areas I never would have imagined. He is so good. If he has spoken a word to you and you're on the fence, take that step. Trust him. Sow into his kingdom. Break that back off the spirit of mammon. And let your heart be filled with overflowing joy as you see him move in your life in ways you could not have imagined. It's time to uproot that evil infiltrating our lives and families. When we walk in purity of heart and speak the truth about the kingdom of God, others will be provoked in a good way. In Matthew 13 and 44, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When, and when a man has found it, he hides it, and jo for joy thereof he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. There is nothing that compares to God's presence, provision, and power. Everything belongs to the king, and he provides everything that we need. You know, when Jesus um, came upon the rich young ruler, this is a powerful section of scripture in Mark 10, 17 through 27. The rich young ruler asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And the man answered and said to him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And the man was sad, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. You see the difference there, the trust in riches. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, 
With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Again, that's Mark 10, 17 through 27. When we're looking at our needs, even needs for the ministry, the question then becomes, I mean, like the disciples ask, well, then who can be saved? I mean, they were probably looking at it that way. In the natural mind, it seems impossible to live or do ministry without money. But God looks at the heart trusting him and provides. With God, all things are possible. When you look at the world's way of doing things, you see that you have to have money to operate. But with God, all things are possible. He will bring the supply when your heart is trusting him and you're following him fully. Now I'm going to end up with this. The spirit of mammon has infiltrated the church. Acts 4, you know, I've been talking about how this, the spirit of mammon, about, about keeping our hearts right, keeping our self individually pure. But I'm going to go a little further now. It's about the church, the, the full, the church, corporate church. Acts 4, 32 to 35. This is how the early church was. Okay, this section, what I'm going to be, this is what it's supposed to be like. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did any one say that any of the things he possessed was his own. Now, I'm not saying I own this. I'm just saying this is how it's supposed to be. This is an exhortation to all of us. But they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And then Acts 2, 42 to 47, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's how it was done. Not like modern day churches, huge buildings needing upkeep, striving with worldly marketing techniques, trying to get people in, then more worldly ways to keep the big tithers. Now, I'm not saying every church is like that, but there's, I'd say the majority, I'm going to just say it, I think personally the majority of them are. And that's not how the kingdom is to grow. It grows by God bringing the people. When you preach the simplicity of the gospel and you serve others, he will bring the people. Big churches may have big numbers, but is it bringing the kingdom? When we seek first the kingdom, God adds. Preaching the kingdom, providing for the needs of the brethren, recognizing and honoring each other in unity and praising God, being content, eating our food with gladness, having simplicity of heart, all things in common, the Lord's adds daily. The world will see that we're different. When The world will know when Christians, when we love, that's what it says. They'll know we're Christians by our love one for another. And how do we show our love? By giving, by serving. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 8 describes qualifications for leadership in the church. And one of them is not a lover of money. And in the King James, it says not greedy of filthy lucre. And in <clears throat> not greedy for gain appears both in Titus 1.7 and 1 Peter 5.2. Titus 1.11 rebukes false teachers who are teaching for shameful gain. The Greek word in 1 Timothy 3.3, not a lover of money, that, that phrase is actually a Greek, well, just one word, aphilargoron also found in Hebrews 13.5, and this is for the whole church. Keep your life free from love of money. Why is that so important, to have leaders who aren't seduced by money? Well, there's an obvious reason, favoritism and decisions, because of who gives money. You know, if somebody gives you a, a lot of money, you're going to be really thankful and your, your heart is going to feel favorable towards them, I can tell you right now. But you can't let your decisions be based on how they want you to go. It's We steward our money by how we believe about God and what he's telling us to do. 
And then Hebrews 13, 5 at the end of that, keep your life free from the love of money. Why? For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We don't have to worry about earthly resources when we have a Father in heaven who owns everything. The king of the kingdom will provide for those who operate according to kingdom principles. God is shaking everything that can be shaken, including the church. He is uprooting every ungodly root and exposing it for what it is. If you're convicted by this, and I hope that you are, we all need to be convicted in a deeper level about this. We need to see it and be free of it to submit to the truth that God is the source of all things, including yourself, and let him have his way. You'll be astounded at what he can do with a heart that trusts him completely. So, Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that every person, under the sound of my voice, who, is con who has been convicted by this, Lord God, Lord, I pray, Lord God, that there's right now, that there's a repentance, a changing of heart, and a desire is stirring to trust you completely, to step out of that box of worldly thinking, and to move forward in faith and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Stirring of the Waters podcast. If you like what you heard today, visit elainehaines.com, that's A-L-A-N-E-H-A-Y-N-E-S.com, for books, blogs, and spiritual growth. You can follow me on Facebook, and subscribe at cpnshows.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. See you next week for the next episode.